Eric Leinenberg is Helen Gould Shepherd Professor of Social Science and the Director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. He is the author of many books, including Houses for the People, How Social Infrastructure Can Help Fight Inequality, Polarization, and the Decline of Civic Life, Going Solo, The Extraordinary Rise and Surprising Appeal of Living Alone, Fighting for Air, The Battle to Control America's Media, and Heat Wave, The Social Autopsy of Disaster in Chicago. He is also the co-author with Aziz Ansari of the New York Times number one bestseller, Modern Romance. His scholarly work has been published in journals including the American Sociological Review, Theory and Society, and Ethnography, and he's contributed to the New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, Rolling Stone, and This American Life. And today we are here to celebrate the publication of his brand new book, 2020, One City, Seven People, and the Year That Everything Changed. We have someone from the Penn Bookstore that is ready to take your orders uh, for the book and we'll ship it to you for free. Um, or you can pick it up at the Penn Bookstore um, tomorrow. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Eric Leinberg. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Is that all right? Um, it's really nice to be at Penn. I love coming here. I was thinking about um, what it was like to come here before the pandemic and um, what it's like to be here now. And the one big change I noticed is I walked up to McNeil Hall today, a building I've spent a lot of time in over the years, and I confidently went and opened the door, but the door was locked. Because now, if you want to be on the Penn campus, you need to have an ID. And if you want to be in the campus buildings, you need to have an ID. And I don't know if that predated the pandemic, but it felt like, oh, we kind of locked things down a little bit. And that felt very much in keeping with this thing that's been happening in the world the last several years, which is like, we've kind of been advised that if we want to be safe and OK, we should socially distance. Remember that concept, social distancing? So be really careful about how we interact with each other and um, who we let in, right? Who, who we keep out is important. And we're talking today, I got to visit an urban studies class. And it's not just any year. This is 2024. Some of you might have heard there's an election this year. Remember, this election's coming up. And we have to make this big decision about what to do in the future of this country. And one of the things that um, some people are concerned about is in America today, we've become extremely individualistic. We've always been a pretty individualistic country, but there's been the strain of individualism that's kind of overwhelmed all kinds of things. And so in 2020, in the face of a serious new pathogen that had lethal consequences and this dangerous disease, Individualism was one tactic for dealing with it, but it was a perilous one, right? And in the face of impending climate change, individualism is one tactic to try to curb this problem, but it's got downsides also. And for those people who think if we're going to keep things going as a democracy and have a healthy society, we need to rekindle the sense that like we're in it together. There's a thing called co the common good, right? That we should care about the collective and not just, not just the individual, but the collective also. This question emerges, like how do we generate the sentiment to care about other people and their well-being? That's kind of at the heart of what I want to talk about today, the social relations in the city, right? And it's just striking to me, like coming to campus for the first time in a while, it's harder to generate this feeling of collective interests, concern about our neighbors, the common good, when the doors are locked all over the place. And one of the predicaments I want to urge us all to think about together is how we live in a society that maintains this spirit of being part of a you know, democratic experiment, a republic, um, concerned with our common and shared experience while also 
you know, dealing with the reality that a lot of people feel very afraid right now and need to lock the door in the largest sense of the term. That's the first thing I thought when I walked to campus today. When I walk in the room today, I think, like, what brave souls all of you are because it's, just, it's turned into kind of a nice night here in Philadelphia. The sun came out today. It's like it's been really cold in New York and icy everywhere. And now suddenly, like, you feel a little sense of thawing today. And you've all decided of all the things that you could do tonight in, in Philadelphia, you want to come back and listen to a lecture about the year 2020. <laughs> right? like, I, what I want to do tonight is I want to go back and think about what happened in 2020. I think that's a brave thing to do, right? Anyone here feel like 2020 was like one of the peak years of their life? Just curious, like 20, like great memories of there. Some nice things happened in 2020. Probably some people could pull them out. Um, but it's, a hard, it's in some ways a hard thing and an unattractive thing to go back to, right? We, one of the theses of the book that I wrote that I was hoping to share with you tonight and sign, uh, but will not be doing that because the book's not here. Um, is this idea that um, uh, 2020 is a hard thing to think about in, in part because like we, we just went through so many things together. Like we, the, the book I wrote, this thing I want to talk to you about tonight, it's we think, when we think 2020, probably the first thing we think about is COVID. Is that fair to say? Pandemic. But my book and what I want to talk to you about tonight is not just COVID, it's also all the things that happened in that extraordinary year of our life. The, economic freefall that happened soon after we found out that this new pathogen was circulating around the globe, like millions of people lost their jobs. And in America, when you lose your job, it's not really clear where you're going to land and where you're going to get, whether you're going to get taken care of, right? It's, this is a tough place to lose things. Safety nets got holes. The market collapsed. Remember there was a moment when the stock markets collapsed and that's not just the kind of thing that bankers of the world care about because lots of Americans have their retirement savings in the market. And when the market crashes, that has all kinds of terrifying consequences for people. And it wasn't just the, the, the economic free fall. Surely you all remember um, that George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota. And it's this incredible, horrifying, unfortunately too familiar, but no less disturbing case of racist police violence. And then there was this uprising of activism and kind of this campaign for, for black lives that was by some counts the largest civil rights protest in our history. And then you probably remember that in a lot of cities people left. So we started talking about things. I'm, I'm sure that there's someone who's taught a course at least one lecture if not an entire course on like the future of downtown. Is anybody coming back to work? Right, the cities got emptied out, and there was a spike in violence in some places. And then that wasn't just the spike in, in violence. Then also there was this kind of attack on democracy. Right? Remember that? The attack on democracy in 2020, culminating in January 6, 2021. And in some ways, that feels like a lifetime ago. Right? A lot has happened since then. But also, here we are. Four years later, Biden versus Trump, the 49ers and the Chiefs, right? It's a, like, there's this uncanny way in which like, we're, we're, we've come all this way, and yet like, we're back in it again. And one thing I want us to engage tonight, and a reason I think it's brave for you to be here, is because um, our response to this situation, what happened to us, what we went through in 2020, I think, has been defined what, by what I like to think of as the, the will not to know. Like we got so overwhelmed with the traumas and the struggles of this moment that we looked for survival strategies. In, in some ways, it's inevitable, right? Like we're all fragile human beings, and that's a lot to take in. Right? I, I'm just curious. I'm a sociologist. I like to do little surveys. Can I do a quick survey with you here? I don't, I don't have IRB clearance or anything, but I just want to ask, how many of you would say tonight sitting here that you feel like you have really processed for yourself what you lived through in 2020, per, like personally what you lived through and kind of collectively what we went through? Just raise your hand really high so I can 
do a quick count. Just like really pro you processed 2020. Okay, with three three hands. Okay, so this is like week. This is the end of the first week of my book being out, and that's three times more hands than have come up at any conversation, every any talk I've had. Um, but really, that's I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing how you did it, Alec, uh, later tonight, um, because it's a it's a lot of stuff to process, um, and in fact, like I. I, I heard this amazing thing the other day. I don't know if any of you else, anyone else here saw, saw this or heard it, but um, the previous president, not the guy who's in office now, but the one who was in office before, was doing a um, speech at a big political rally, and he said this incredible thing. Um, he said, uh, I mean, he said a lot of incredible things, but this one was especially, I thought, um, revealing. Um, and what he said was, um, you should ask yourself, are you better off now than you were five years ago? Say that again to you. Are you better off now than you were five years ago? Now, why did I find that so fascinating? You know why I found that fascinating? That's a, that's a, it's like a, it's a version of a line that political candidates who are running against an incumbent have been using for a long time. You know what the line is supposed to be, right? Say it again. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Why is that? Because the, the invitation is to compare yourself to the, where you were when the previous party was in power, or in this case, when, when I was in power. Are you better off now than you were four years ago? Five years ago is a different invitation altogether, right? Five years ago says, could you all please not think about 2020? Could we all act like 2020 doesn't count for our story? Right? Could we just like to get it out of your memory altogether? And I think that's a fascinating request because what, you know, what it says, that there's actually a theory behind it, and, it's, and, and, I, and you need to know it in 2024 because the theory is... Um, what happened in 2020 doesn't count. It's an aberration. Right? It's like a, 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 a weird thing. So when you think about this important political choice that you have to make as a voter, or if you're a historian, think of 2020 as this anomaly that shouldn't really be assessed. Right? Which is a, a one, that's one theory of the case. And another theory about all of this is when you make a political decision, when you have a vote, when you're choosing a leader, what you really want to think about is how capable is this leader of dealing with crises, right? Like imagine if you live in a universe where there's climate change, or there's Israel and Gaza, or there's Russia and Ukraine, or there's China and Taiwan, or there's Iran and nuclear weapons, right? Or there's pathogens circulating around. Like, just hypothetically imagine that that's happening in the world right now, and you're choosing your leader. It, it kind of does seem like there's a case to be made for thinking about how capable is this leader, this party, at dealing with a crisis. And rather than looking at the performance of a leader or a government or a nation as an anomaly, we, we would want to really investigate it. In fact, like one thing I want you to think about, this, I actually don't really, I'm not going to give a political talk tonight, but I, like this is important framing. I, I actually don't think that there's anybody in America who's got more of a vested interest in us not thinking about 2020, not processing what happened in 2020, than the previous president. So you will be asked to ignore it, to deny it, to forget it, you know, to treat it as beyond history. And the first thing I want to try to argue tonight is I think that's an enormous mistake. It'd be an enormous mistake for us, politically, sociologically. The real thing I want to try to persuade you of is uh, to work with me on this idea that has motivated an enormous amount of my work throughout my career. And it's the idea that um, the reason that we should be looking at 2020 is not to tell us how to vote. I'm, guessing when I look around the room, I'm not, no, no one's 
in this room is really like trying to figure out like which of these guys should I vote for in November. I'm just waiting for a little more information so I can assess the performance. There's a there's like a fascinating species of American who can't figure out who to vote for until like early November of the election year, late October. I, like, I would love for someone to go and really like hang out and do a deep ethnographic study of the people who just can't, they're just, they're trying to make up their mind. But I don't, I'm guessing that that's not the crowd I'm with tonight. And that's not really the point of, of what I'm here to do anyway. What I, what I am here to do is to, to encourage us to think along these lines. The reason to think about 2020 and for us to go back there is because crises have a way of revealing things. Who we are, what, what we value, whose lives matter. When, when things break down, a lot of that stuff comes into relief. We can see it really clearly. And I don't want to just like assert that idea, but I want to try to show you what I mean by that. This is a big claim, but in a way, you're not here tonight to hear about 2020 you're here tonight because I want to tell you something about the soul of this country and the way in which this country differs from other countries. And in the process, I want to tell you something about how cities work. So that's my promise. I'm going to take, I don't know, 35 or 40 minutes from here. And then since we can't sign books, I'm going to have everybody go on their phones and order the book on Amazon. <laughs> At the same time, we're going to do it in sync. No, I'm just kidding. OK, you ready, to, you ready for 2020 now? Here we go. Okay, um, the reason I think that it's so difficult to go back and start this process of accessing what happened is because there's something fundamentally that was off in the world in 2020 and it started at a very early moment. The first person whose voice you hear in the book is a guy named Benjamin Beer who was a fellow in cardiology at Mount Sinai Hospital in Lower Manhattan uh, when the pandemic started. And he was in a tough situation because he was working in a hospital that was getting busy and that had clearly COVID coming in. But he's also married to a young woman. He's a guy in his early 30s. And he was married to a young woman who uh, had just gone through a really brutal round of uh, treatments for uh, cancer, kind of leukemia. And she had massively compromised immune system. So he had to go do his work. And as a physician, it felt like his work had never been more important. He never felt like it was so more important for him to just show up. But also he knew that going to work meant risking exposure and infection and coming home to the person he loved more than anyone in the world who might not be able to make it if she got infected. And he said, the thing it ma really made me realize is that in this moment, when we first learned about the new virus, this new coronavirus, he said the thing that connects us to the world, the most basic thing we do that connects us in the world, transformed. He said, like, what, what, what do we do to live? What's the most basic thing we need to live? We need to breathe. What is breathing? Think about it. You're here. We're here in McNeil Hall. We're on the University of Pennsylvania campus. Probably you've all spent some time here, and you associate, like, a certain feeling to the air in this place. You come into this room. You take, you take the world in, right? And you breathe out, and you give something back. And that's like the basic chemistry of life. I would take, take the air in and give it back. It's what keeps us connected. It's what brings, gives us life. And he said the thing about the beginning of the pandemic that was so disturbing initially is that the fundamental thing that we do to make, make it in the world became also the thing that was most likely to kill us. Right? Like now breathing, this fundamental thing, the basics, is fraught. The moment you leave your home, like who, what, what else am I breathing? What else am I taking in? What happens when I breathe out? And I think for a lot of people, from the beginning of the moment when COVID hit, breathing became challenging. The other thing I think, so that's the first is like how we relate to the environment that we're in. The second thing, urban social relations, how do we relate to each other? 
Because what Ben Beer was saying is not just that it was the taking in the breath, but it was also in the giving, you run the risk of spreading this disease, infecting someone else. So now that, that what, what, what's happened is that we start to think about our relationship to other people in a different way. And I thought about this very personally because in the beginning of March of 2020, I was uh, invited to go give a book talk in Cleveland, Ohio. And I was kind of hoping at that point, because COVID was happening in New York City, and I, I kept hoping that they were going to call me and tell me, like, the, the talk is off, you know? It's crazy for you to come here. And we're entering into this dangerous moment. But do, I don't know if you, do you remember the moment where, like, there were cases in New York, but there were no cases anywhere else in most of the country. And the reason, do you remember what the reason was? You remember the reason? It was because there were no tests anywhere else in the country, right? So like you couldn't, you know, you couldn't test for COVID anywhere else. So they, I, I kept hoping that they would spare me going. It was like a huge book talk. They had done like one book, one county for Cuyahoga County. I was speaking at a theater with 3,500 people in Cleveland. It was a great, amazing night for me. It was sold out. They'd done a year of programming. So I wanted to go, but I also kind of wanted not to go. You know, I wanted them to cancel, but they weren't canceling. So I flew there, and of course, the moment I got off the plane that had three people on it, on the radio, it was like, we found our first three cases of COVID in Cleveland. The market crashed 1,200 points, right? There was nobody else at the hotel, and 350 people came to the talk. But whatever, I did it. And I flew home the next morning early, and here's why this breathing thing mattered to me. I get a call from my mother-in-law who's watching the kids, and she says, uh, your son, who's 13 years old at the time, has, a, has spiked a fever, and he's really, really tired. Now, this for me was pretty terrifying because I had been tracking COVID for a while and learning about what was happening, and I realized that you know, we didn't know much about this disease and how it worked. And we didn't know if kids could be affected all that much. There were some reports that some kids were having this really strong immune response and uh, were struggling and I didn't know what was gonna happen to my kid. So I raced home and then I got this advice, which is if someone in your family, tell me if you remember this moment, if someone in your family has COVID, what you do with them is you move them into a private room, like you put them in the bedroom and you have them stay in the bed and you close the door and you like slide food and bring water in, right? And whatever you do, you stay away, right? It's just like a quick show of hands again. Anyone here a parent? Any, any parents in the room? Okay. Anyone ever been a child with parents? Just like all the parents will know this and the, some of the kids might People who have been kids will remember this too. Like when you're a parent and your child is sick and they have a likely have a sickness that is terrifying and who knows what's going to happen, every impulse in your body tells you to go climb in the bed with your child, right? To, to like be there and to hold your kid and to get as close as you possibly can. And the messaging that we got at the time was like, don't, don't do that. Right? The interaction that you're going to have with your kid is dangerous for you, and then you're going to spread it to your spouse, and then to your other child, and then to the, whoever else is around. So now, in addition to, I mean, just spoiler alert, we hugged our kid. You know, we stayed with our kid. Right? We didn't, we ignored it. We ignored the advice. But, but think about this moment. Like, our relationship to the air, the breathing was off, and our relationship to other people felt off. Like, how are we going to relate to each other from now on? Should we lock all the doors at Penn from now on? Right? Should we close the campus from now on? Should we go remote from now on? All of this is happening. Right? So it's like a fairly difficult challenge. This is where I think it gets sociologically interesting, right? And interesting to people who, who study the city, because now we start to reveal ourselves. Right? Crises, we reveal who we are. What do I mean by that? Remember that moment where the economy is collapsing and we didn't know what to do and we came up with this idea that, well, most people should probably stay home right now, socially distanced, right? But there are some people out here who are serving roles that are so important for the economy and society that we're going to call them essential. Remember this? 
Some people are essential workers. And we are going to come up with this category of the essential worker to designate those people whose labor really matters, whose time really matters. And amazingly, the essential, remember the essential workers thing? I'm going to make sure you're with me on this, the essential workers. So the essential workers were not the sociology professors, right? <laughs> The essential workers were not the big, I'm sorry, they weren't even the BlackRock finance people. They were not the, they were not the finance people in New York, you know, the, 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 the titans of New York City. They were not the big lawyers. They were not the NBA players. When I, I did hundreds of interviews in this project, and for so many people, I said, like, do you remember the moment when the pandemic became real to you? And I can't tell you how many people said, yes, it was the night they canceled the NBA games. And I realized this must be serious if they're canceling the NBA. NBA players were not essential workers. Who are the essential workers? Well, healthcare workers, right, the higher end ones. But the essential workers, fundamentally, they were clerks in stores, right? They were delivery people. They were people driving public transit. They were people working in uh, the meat packing plants, right, in the poultry plants, right? People doing warehousing and shipping, right? All, all that infrastructure stuff, Cust custodians in some places. Those are the essential workers. Now, Amazing category. Think about this category. We, cre we create this category, the essential worker, and what that does, one would think, is it establishes a kind of hierarchy of utility which corresponds to our sense of honor. Right? Why, why call someone an essential worker if not to honor them? Right? To, to show a sign of social appreciation for the role they're playing. And one would think, like if you were going to have a reckoning and you create a category like this that once one becomes an essential worker one also gets like collective appreciation you could imagine guaranteed health care right you could imagine that being essential worker means like you are first in line to get PPE right masks and all those other things one could imagine um, other kinds of recognition like a bonus Right, a, like a, a some kind of government. Right? Remember, like you could do all those things, and what happened in the United States is, okay, for the health workers in New York City, at the end of the day, at six or seven o'clock, when they would leave the hospitals and come back to the neighborhoods, there was this amazing moment of banging pots and pans in solidarity, which was a beautiful thing. But for the most part, to be called an essential worker in America in 2020 meant to be deemed expendable. I think it's really important to note that. Like, if you got called an essential worker, what that meant fundamentally is that you became an expendable person because we sent you into the world without the protections that you needed and we put you in harm's way. Why is it that some groups in the United States wound up with these elevated rates of exposure to COVID, death and disease? Well, to some extent, it depends on which specific group you're talking about. There's a story about nursing homes, which is that there is an enormous amounts of death in nursing homes in the United States. Not all nursing homes in every society had high levels of mortality. In the U.S., and it turns out also in Canada, the very high levels of mortality, in part because the people who work in nursing homes providing care typically don't have enough income from one nursing home, that that's their full job, and they can organize their work routine around this one facility. They often work at multiple different nursing homes. And they moved in the United States from nursing home to nursing home, from institution to institution. And in a way, the precarious nature of their labor, the hustle that they had to make to make ends meet, meant that they wound up spreading this disease from place to place. Right? And we also know that relatively lax standards about how we let people live in nursing homes in the United States meant that some of them were far more crowded right, with the kinds of conditions that would lead to transmission of disease. So to live in a nursing home in the United States was to be in a much more precarious situation than it was to live in a nursing home in other places. Um, we also saw at that time that essential workers were disproportionately black. They were disproportionately Latino. There's a chapter in my book where um, I look at why different neighborhoods in New York had different rates of mortality. And I don't like the kind of 
I like to stop at the obvious explanation. Like if you look at a map of who died where in New York City, you can see that lots of people in Manhattan managed to avoid the, the worst of it. And the reason is they left town and went to beach homes and country homes. And the place got a lot less dense, but also it was not all that crowded. Where did you find high concentrations of mortality in New York City? In neighborhoods where you had essential workers, you know, people who were going out into the labor force, even when there was no PPE, and you know, no one really had a capacity to uh, prevent the disease from spreading. It was a combination of essential work and also cra residential crowding. Right? So if you lived in, a, in an apartment that, that had a lot of people, multi-generational apartments, you're at far higher risk of contracting COVID and of dying early on. Right? Urban social relations. So there's a way in which, just to give you a sense of this, this idea, crises have a way of revealing things, when we could start to see things, in many cases quite clearly, as 2020 started rolling. Right? There were these revelations that we had. There, Maybe not, maybe revelations is too strong a word because maybe the things that we we're seeing were the open secrets, like the things we all kind of know when we live in the United States but just don't talk about all that much. They were becoming part of the conversation. But one of the really puzzling things about what happened in the United States is did we respond to the idea of the essential worker by actually thanking them, by actually providing them with protections, by actually compensating them? or even collectively saying, thank you, we did not. We did not. It's like, it's like we went to the edge of this moral precipice, and we saw something about ourselves, but instead of acting, we, we turned around and walked the other way. That's a really powerful thing that we should know about ourselves. And there are a whole series of things that are like that, things that became visible to us, things that we can understand about ourselves that we haven't fully dealt with. I want to give you one other example of a topic that um, became really important here in the United States and that puzzled a lot of people outside of the United States about this year. And the topic I want to talk to you about is um, masks. Remember this issue of masks? Like who, who's going to wear a mask and what does it mean to wear a mask? And um, maybe you even remember some of the more dramatic moments around masks that came up in 2020 in 2020 because one might think in the abstract like if there's a, a new virus circulating around the world and there's a, a basic technology that we can use to limit its spread that has worked in the past to limit its spread um, that even if we don't know exactly how effective this technology will be for this specific virus we would be tempted out of just the precautionary principle to, to use them right, to, to protect ourselves. And something really fascinating happened in the United States, which is that the debates over masks became much more contentious and conflictual than they did in most other societies. And I think it's worth pausing, crises reveal things, to figure out what happened here and why. It's kind of an interesting story. In the very beginning of the pandemic, the World Health Organization actually did not recommend that people everywhere get masks. There's a big debate about why that happened. One, one of the arguments was, well, there weren't enough masks in the world, and the World Health Organization was really concerned that if they recommended that everyone go out and get a mask, people working in healthcare facilities uh, would not have access to them. And they, they wanted to make sure that uh, healthcare workers had access to masks before everybody else. And so one theory was like the WHO was being very cautious just to make sure that the supply was okay. Do you remember that idea that came out? There's another thing, which is that, um, uh, and Guo Bin Yang is here who wrote this fantastic book about, about Wuhan and also about China and the way that China handled uh, the initial outbreak of, of the, uh, the coronavirus. Another theory is that China used its power and influence to lobby the WHO to kind of downplay the crisis in the early periods. There's kind of concern that maybe China was not as transparent about the reporting of the prevalence of the disease as, as it might have been. 
And there's also concern that, you know, that there's a long history of international health agencies naming viruses after or in association with certain places and thereby stigmatizing those countries in ways that proved economically damaging and socially damaging for quite a long time, right? Like the Spanish flu, MERS, right? There's all, all of these, all of these uh, diseases that got associated with a place and the World Health Organization, some theorized, wanted to kind of downplay the significance of this, like keep the, keep the world churning. Don't allow this kind of uh, criticism of China or this region of the world to flourish. Some scientists said, look, we just don't know how effective masks can be at preventing the, at COVID and the spread of the coronavirus, so we're not going to do it. So for a few months, the WHO is relatively silent on this question. Now, there are a number of countries in the world that were powerfully affected by the SARS epidemic in 2003 and to some extent by, the, by MERS. Uh, Singapore, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan. There's a number of countries that, had, that initiated a pandemic response to 2003 out of concern that if SARS spread, the case fatality rate from someone who, for someone who contracted SARS was incredibly high. So if SARS was spreading, it was going to spread a lot. This could be a catastrophic disease. And there are a number of countries that came away from this experience in which they learned, fortunately, SARS was not as transmissible as people initially feared. But the lesson they took away was, like, you really have to have a precautionary stance as an event like this is coming in. And what does that mean? It means being prepared to produce and distribute masks and, and having uh, internal infrastructure and produ production system for subsidizing that so that you can get it going. It means having a system of testing cases and tracing positive cases so that you know where the disease is and who might be a carrier. It, it means having a border policy in which you stop traffic quickly. And a number of countries had kind of that were in this orbit and, and Asian societies that have a longer history of uh, w using masks as a prized scientific advancement, a way of being modern, um, people started using masks. But in mo most countries in the Western world, people were reluctant to do it. So that's the case in the United States. And actually, the US looks a lot like England, say, in the early days, in terms of who's wearing a mask and who's not wearing a mask. But in late March of 2020, the science starts to come in that actually if you wear the right mask and you wear it well, you really can reduce transmissions of COVID. And one way we know this is because while in healthcare facilities there were spikes of COVID in the early days, when they got the proper equipment, it was kind of remarkable actually how little transmission of the coronavirus there was in medical institutions. And there are a variety of tests that um, people were making in which they were able to really uh, observe empirically how how much masks did. Which is not, they didn't do everything, but they clearly made a difference. So early April, the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention changes its policy on mask wearing. And on April 3rd, the policy change becomes official. And the person who announces the CDC's new policy is the previous president, the last president of the United States. And some of you might remember this moment. He gets up before the country's media and he says, today the CDC has announced that we have new guidelines. CDC would like everyone to wear a mask when they're in public settings, prevent transmission of the disease. Personally, I'm not gonna do it. I don't really know that you need to do it. You remember this moment? Personally, I'm not gonna do it. Now, Remember the first thing I said about um, leadership and crises and how we think about you know, what happened in different places, how we think about choosing leaders in a world where crises happen? This is quite a statement. You know, the federal policy is A, I'm going to do B. And I think B is okay for you too. Well, we all know kind of what happens next. It turns out that the message inside the administration is I really don't want you to wear a mask because I see, as president, I see the mask 
as a symbol of weakness and fear, right? It's soft, and I want to convey strength and confidence and manliness. And the way that you are going to show me that you are on my team, that you are with me in this project, is you are going to bear your face. So my, my bare face becomes powerful. And it becomes known to everyone inside the world of the administration that the way you establish your standing as part of this approach is by not wearing a mask. So some of you may recall Mike Pence, the vice president, who also, you should know, becomes the head of the nation's task force on COVID. Other countries had, you know, medical doctors and health experts uh, serve that role, but we had Mike Pence. Mike Pence goes to the Mayo Clinic, right, one of the great healthcare institutions in America where people go if they have really serious illnesses that defy easy cures. And he stands with patients and doctors and nurses, and he is the only person in the hospital who defies the hospital's rule to wear a mask. So now it becomes clear to everyone. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember the Mike Pence doesn't wear a mask moment? So now I, I, I want you to think about this sociologically. I do not want you to think about this morally or politically. I just want you to think about this sociologically. OK. If you're on that team, it's now pretty clear how you express yourself, right? But now here's what happens. Dave Grazian, he feels very upset about this. You know, David's a professor of social science. He knows all about you know, our mutual responsibility to one another. He believes that there's an established public health framework for dealing with this case. He respects the scientists at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And he believes, no, we should all be wearing masks. The CDC just said that. Even the president just said that. So Dave gets on social media, and he changes his photograph on Facebook and now Dave's got a mask on his Facebook page, right? And Lisa Servone, she goes onto Twitter and she changes her name on Twitter to Lisa hashtag wears a mask Servone, right? And then um, did, did this happen in your social media worlds? I'm, I'm willing to bet it did. And then the people running for president in the Democratic Party and for office they start to put their campaign ads up and they're wearing masks. Do you remember they're wearing masks in the campaign ads? And, and, and that becomes a thing, right? We all are symbol, we're, we're, we're signifying to each other, like wearing a mask is important. It's an expression of solidarity and commitment to this scientific thing. And, the, and this, tell me if I'm the only one who experiences this. This is definitely happening. You're walking down the street in New York City and here's Alec, you know, my, as a, someone walking down the street and I'm wearing a mask. And Alec's wearing a mask, and I don't really know Alec, and I don't really do this, but the feeling I have in my heart is like, yes, you know, we're on the same team. You know, we're got a mask on, see, got a mask on. And then, did this happen to anyone? You're in the grocery store, right? And it's April. Where's, you're not wearing a mask? Did anyone have this experience? Like, you, you're not wearing a mask? And, and the feeling is like your blood is boiling now. Like, you're, who are you? not to be wearing a mask. Don't you know that you're in a pandemic? And for all you know, I'm immunocompromised and I have an elderly grandparent at home and we're walking through the streets and our blood's boiling. Did it, can you raise your hand if you had any moment like this for yourself? I'm just curious. So, okay, thank you. thank you. You're all making me feel very nervous and uncomfortable here for a minute. But everything got charged, right? Everything got charged. And the next thing you knew, there's these viral videos going around where like, Americans are brawling with each other in Walmart. Do you remember these videos? And someone goes into Starbucks and they body slam someone else and someone gets shot for not wearing a mask or for wearing a mask and it becomes impossible to keep track. And it's like this little piece of fabric, right? This little piece of fabric suddenly takes on all of the weight of our political fights. And we invest this meaning, right, into this thing. And so it's now whether you wear a mask, it's not really about, I mean, it is about your view of whether it's going to protect you or not, but it's also about, like, who you are and what team you're on. 
right? what you stand for. And then it's not just about masks anymore, right? Now it's like there's this new medication if you've got COVID called remzidivir. But I have this doctor I heard from who says that the actual medicine you should be using is hydrochloro. Can you remember someone? Can anyone say that word? You know, I, yeah. yeah so Alec used to take that, so he knows. So, 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 so then there's this. Uh, this uh, still, take still take it. So. Right, and then it was, and then it was right. So this, remember this. There's, there's oh, and, and why aren't you? I'm not getting because it it's not owned by big pharma, and they don't want you. You know, they don't want you to do to to do this thing. So now it's like there's a one team's got one drug, right? There's a, a red state drug and there's a blue state drug. Well, our medication is now politicized, and then towards the end of 2020, those vaccines rolling out. And there's like a blue state view of how to do the vaccine and a red state view of the vaccine, right? And then there's an election, and it's a real election. It's a corrupt election. This is all to say that um, 2020 did something to us. Right? It reveals something, who we are, but it also took us someplace. And I was alive in America before 2020. I, I, I'm not going to try to persuade you tonight that like, the reason that we're distrustful and the reason that we're divided and the reason we're angry at each other and ideological and affectively polarized is because of 2020. Like, that would be ludicrous to say that. All those things were happening, but 2020 accelerated them. It intensified them. It hardened that stuff kind of injected it into our veins, right? One could say at a moment when like the, the way to get through this thing was to go back to the beginning of my lecture, so, you know, like, solidarity, like to some sense of connection, like we're, 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 we're not going to solve this on our own. We went in this very different direction. One reason I think it's important for us to be talking about this is because we're still in that thing. You know this concept of long COVID? You've heard about long COVID? It's probably some of you here have experienced long COVID or someone in your friend, family or friend group like, has experienced long COVID. Long COVID is no joke, right? It's a serious medical condition and one that we probably need to be pouring a lot more resources and energy into. It's affected a huge number of people. One thing I want to argue to you tonight is that long COVID is not just a medical condition. Long COVID is also a kind of social disease. And, it, and, it is, and we are still in it. It still has a claim on us. The, these things that I've described that were there in 2020, they are, they are part of the story of where we are in America right now. Right? There are things that happened to us, ways we changed, things that got in us that we have not kicked. And it's all the more difficult to kick it if our stance towards it is it didn't happen. Right. Let's not talk about it. The fact that three of us in this room have processed this and no one else has means that it's, it's easy. It's right. It's 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 easy for, for us to just kind of move on as if this stuff didn't happen. It's like like the people you know in your life who were traumatized in all kinds of ways as kids, but who'd never taken the time to process and deal with it. Like what happens is all of the pathology of that it just like acts out on them. Right. They kind of lose control, and in some ways, I think that's where we are right now. Like, we've experienced this thing together. And because we've turned away from it, it has us in, in its grip. Right? We're still there. I'll say that when the pandemic started, um, I, ha I shared this instinct that so many people had, which was socially distanced, close the door, you know, get, Take care of yourself and your family and hope that you come out on the other side. Okay. I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. And I also had that feeling like it would be good to take all of these experiences and just kind of tuck them away somewhere, put them in a box. But precisely because from the time I wrote this first book about the heat wave through today, so much of my work has been about 
taking advantage of a crisis to learn something about ourselves, I also knew that I, I had to engage it. And the book is a book of social, social analysis, as you can tell. And I try to answer the kinds of questions that I've been posing for us tonight. Like, why did masks become so much more contentious here than in other places? Why, why did we come up with this idea of who's an essential worker and then walk away from that? There's a chapter in the book that deals with the question of why is it that um, societies all over the world had this kind of distancing and disruption of their ordinary routines, experienced something like what the great French sociologist Emile Durkheim calls anime, right? But only in the United States do you see this incredible spike in violent crime of all varieties, not just, right, not just gun crimes. There are other countries that have more homicide and more, more gun crimes, but we even have this thing, this incredible spike in reckless driving, in vehicular manslaughter. All these kind of pathologies this, like, that emerge here but don't emerge in other places. What, what, what was it about the American condition that made us so prone to that kind of thing? So a side of the book is going through these kinds of puzzles. But as I was writing the book, it also occurred to me that to treat this year analytically at a distance in the way that I'm doing now is to miss something really fundamental about the, the, the time, this time, which is the way in which it did affect us personally, humanly, emotionally, the way in which it took us to these places that I've been trying to describe. And I realized that the, the best thing that we can do as social scientists and scholars to try to tap into this powerful human experience is to really kind of try to get to know people well and, and tell their stories too. There's a tradition in the kind of part of sociology that does ethnography and there's a lot of great ethnography in urban studies. And when I look at your urban studies list of all the speakers in the past at different events, I notice there's a lot of ethnographers here, I think in part because the stories that ethnographers tell, the characters they reveal, um, speak to very universal concerns in many cases, even if they're very particular people. And I realized that by treating these questions at arm's length, as we sometimes do as social scientists, I was getting some part of the experience, but I was missing something fundamental. And I made a decision that in addition to doing this kind of puzzle solving analytic work, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to try to get at the diversity of experience from this year and to represent it in a way that would help people process the kinds of things I'm saying we tried to put in boxes, kick into the closet. And at first, my impulse was I want to go and try to have reporting on experiences that people are having in different parts of the world. But as you might recall, the pandemic didn't stop. Societies were, for the most part, closed. There was no like traveling to China or traveling to Japan or even traveling to Canada as an American to go and do that research. So I realized I live in New York, and I had this convenient fact of the world coming to me. And so I decided I was going to, to do something. I was going to try to really get to know and, and profile someone from every borough of New York City. And I, I came up with this rather aesthetic and not necessarily scientific technique for doing it. I, I tried to write for myself, like, what are the big stories? What are the big tr social trends in each of the boroughs? Like if I was going to try to characterize the borough's experience, what would I include there? And I did that. And then I had been doing these large-scale interview projects with teams of researchers from NYU. Um, and I had talked to all these people. And I, after I had established what the trends were for different boroughs, I looked through our database of subjects and I thought about which people we talked to who spoke to some of those experiences. And then I looked in for some others as well, so some people who we hadn't interviewed before. And so uh, in the book there's a uh, profile of a woman who's an elementary school principal in Chinatown in Lower Manhattan, the principal of the elementary school where she went as a child and where her husband went and where one of her children went. And you learn in her story, her name is Mei Li, 
and you learn in her story so many things about what was happening in schools, why, why schools aren't just places for learning, but also you know, community hubs and places that feed children, and in some cases, families. And you learn one of the really important things that happened in 2020. You learn about this incredible spike in anti-Asian hate crime and violence. You learn how even in Chinatown, the place where you go to be closer to Asian American experience, you learn about this incredible spike in anti-Asian hate. And you see all in Mei Li's story, all the kind of extraordinary things that people did to try to hold everything together um, at a time of real challenge. The story of a couple in Brooklyn, a, a central worker who works in as a corrections officer in Rikers Island, whose wife teaches in a different school, and they were effectively kicked out of their progressive family-run daycare by the community without being told because after the first wave of the pandemic, the community was worried that as a corrections officer in Rikers, the father was a risk to the health of everyone else in the community, so they just didn't tell them that the daycare was back open again, which was a real trauma for them about class and how class works and what labor works looks like. It's the story of a man in Staten Island who got radicalized on the right, which is a thing that happened to millions of Americans during 2020. He was trying to open up a bar with a buddy of his, and it took him about a year to get a license from the New York State Liquor Authority. Couldn't figure out why the Liquor Authority exists pretty much only to grant liquor licenses. Why does it take so long? They couldn't figure out. It just felt like the state didn't care whether they did their business. And finally, when they got their liquor license, just a few months before the pandemic started, Everything got shut down, and over the course of the next several months, they were unable to maintain a business and make things work. And eventually, this guy kind of cracked and said, I can't follow the restrictions anymore. I'm declaring my bar an autonomous zone, and we're just going to stay open for business. And that triggered a whole series of conflicts with the police, demonstrations with the Proud Boys, I tell the story in the book not because I'm an advocate for his decision to declare his bar an autonomous zone, but because it's important for us to try to put ourselves in the shoes of people who felt like they were on their own, not getting the kind of support that they needed during this moment of crisis from different perspectives. This family in Brooklyn had that feeling, like we're on our own, the daycares let us out. The elementary school principal in lower Manhattan had this feeling. Department of Education is not providing me with the support I need to maintain the school. Danny Presti in Staten Island had this feeling from a very different kind of experience. So there's someone from every borough. There's two other characters as well. When I finished with the five boroughs, I realized I'm missing some things here that I have to tell in the story of a book about 2020. First is I realized that by talking to people through the year and learning their stories, I had failed to talk to somebody who died early in the pandemic, and you couldn't write the story of 2020 without reckoning with what happened uh, in a family where there was a death. And so I worked with the MTA, the public transit in New York, had a lot of MTA workers who died early in the pandemic and they connected me with the family. Um, and I tell the story of a family, of a guy who immigrated to the United States, immigrated 30 years ago from India, was a physicist, student of mathematics, spent 30 years working as a custodian in the MTA before dying in COVID. And finally, like what else was I really not capturing in 2020? I, I had missed by following people in the boroughs the story of something hugely important. I'm going to wrap up in a second. The story of the uh, movement for black lives and the reaction to the murder of George Floyd. And this part of America that showed up in 2020 in a way that I think is also really important for us to remember. Right? Not just the ways in which we failed, but also the ways in which at some point, Millions of Americans, more than ever to do this before, got together and said, like, we, we, we've had enough, and it's, it's time to start to think about what another world would look like, and actually we demand it. And, you know, it's a pretty interesting question, like the uprisings, the demonstrations. For many people, this was an incredible moment of hope, solidarity real engagement, right? This is not social distancing. This is like being out in the streets, banding together, trying to make a better world. 
We know to a lot of people this, the presence of that movement and the anger expressed by that felt terrifying and led them to go the route that the guy went in Staten Island. This country is falling apart. There was a moment when everything that was solid was melting into air and it seemed like we could wind up in a very different universe where one could imagine the Black Lives Matter movement taking us to this radical transformation. Remember those moments of hope? Like what could be building here? And I think all of us would say that at this point in history, we haven't yet landed at that spot. But kind of most optimistic ideas about what transformations would happen in cities and this country around racial justice, around social justice, we didn't get there. But I guess I want to leave this, my part of this conversation, and open it up by saying one thing about 2020 that I've tried to emphasize tonight and I think is important for us to remember is that it's a really long year. It's not over yet. And if we go back and think about, you know, historical moments, 1776 and 1789 and 1914, 1945, 1968, 2001. It turns out that their meaning gets made over a long process, right? And, and the thing that we think is foreclosed maybe at the moment turns out to still be there. The experiences, the collective experiences we have together are these resources for us to build on. And so my book, you should know, and these are the last things I'll tell you now, it's not a history. I'm not, I was not trying to write a history of this time. It's too early to write a history of 2020. It is an attempt to ask us to look closer and to not give in to the call uh, to pretend it didn't happen or to treat it as an anomaly, as a thing that didn't count, but to start this process of reckoning, of recognizing of assessing what we went through, of talking with each other about it, of integrating it into our political conversations, into our conversations about elections and leadership and the world we want, because I think we're going to be living with the legacy of 2020 for a very long time. And I think what that legacy is will be up to us to make. OK, thank you very much. All right, we have some time for questions. I have a question. Yeah, it could be. You didn't have a question. I was just going to keep on talking. So it's really good that you did. So I, um, I'm interested in this idea of turning away from the whole crisis. Yeah. And also, um, you know, you kind of ended by talking about how long it takes to process things, right? So. Given where we are now, what, there seems to be a middle ground. What would it mean now for us to turn toward it? To turn to what? To turn, turn toward it, yeah. As, as opposed to turning away from it. Well, I mean, I think in the most, I mean, there, there's different levels for that. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess, like, this book has been out for one week. So I only know what I've experienced in the last week of events. And all this is the first time I've talked about the book outside of New York City. I guess I did an event in Canada a month ago, but um, Canada doesn't really count. So, um, so what I've experienced is that uh, very few people say, I feel like I've really processed this. And that actually when we start to talk about it, whether it's like a Q&A thing or the conversations that happen after, actually all of us have a lot at our disposal that we want to share and work through and all kinds of stories to tell that bring back some of the moments of that time. Um, some, some that have clear political significance, some that have more personal significance or sociological significance. But it's like so much happened so fast in that year that it was impossible for us to absorb it. So it might be that there's personal things that happened you know, in your family, um, your relationship, in your relationship to work. And you're thinking about, like, will I ever do this again that helped you think about what you value, that you've stop thinking about because you just went back to the routine or you found some new thing. And it might be worth personally kind of going back to those things and making sense of it. Politically, I think, and I, you know, the, the, this first idea, 
civically, like we we are in a big moment. You know, we, we have some really important decisions to make. And I think, you know, I made the case that nobody wants us to think less about this than the last president. It's like how it's so are you better off now than you were five years ago? For me, it's like such a powerful statement, right? It just reveals everything about that. And I, I think we, we shouldn't just let that topic become an anomaly that's not fair to discuss in 2024 because it's outside the but no one could have expected it or every, every country struggled with the pandemic or in the absence of a clear story, it becomes possible for the governor of a state like Florida to say like, we did it better than everybody else. And, and that's not, that was not true, by the way. And one reason that's important is because, re remember this invocation of the countries that were affected by SARS and the ways in which it shifted them or pushed them to develop this more precautionary principle for how they dealt with COVID. They built up a public health infrastructure and developed a set of strategies that allowed them to successfully manage this crisis much more than other countries. And one really important example of a place that did this that is unexpected is Australia. So like, what's so important about Australia is that in the beginning of 2020, Australia is politically divided and polarized. There's a crisis, a polarization crisis in Australia. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison is a right-wing leader. They've just had these historic bushfires, massive wildfires, and he is on record as being adamantly against the idea that this has anything to do with climate change, right? So he's totally skeptical of this whole scientific enterprise. COVID arrives, small liberal, hyper-individualist, right? Distrustful society. And one would think that Australia is primed to go the same direction as the US or the UK, right? Let's, let's like push it aside and trust the market to take care of it or we'll get really divided around it. Australia goes in a totally different direction. Morrison forms this kind of emergency health government where he brings experts from all six states and the territories of Australia, the leaders of each state plus their health ministers come together, they form a council, they have like a bipartisan uh, you know, federal approach, and then each state has its own leeway to impose its own set of restrictions. They close the border, they subsidize the production of PPE, they do testing and tracing. Like Austra Australia has a negative excess death rate from 2020. If, if the US had the same mortality rate as Australia from, the, from COVID, 900,000 Americans would be alive today. So it's a huge number, 900,000 people. So I don't think it was fated that the U.S. would go in the way that it did or that Australia would go in the way that it did. I think those things really matter. And so I think it's important for us to not give in to the, like, let's just let it rip in the future kinds of revisionist history that we're going to get. And for us to be thinking about not only who did well and why and who didn't do well and why in 2020, but how do we... How do we want to think about crises and the management of crises and the capacity to deal with these situations in 2024 and in the future? This has to be the kind of thing that we govern around. And we have to do it knowing that we live in an age of a tremendous uncertainty. Like we're not going to be able to tell exactly what the new pathogen is going to be like or how to best treat it. And we're not going to, like, we're, we, we, we might be planning for the storm surge to come from a violent hurricane, but actually what happens is suddenly it rains 10 times more than it's ever rained in an hour, and the city is drowning. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what to do. But what we can be certain of is that dealing with crises is becoming the kind of thing that every government has to do. Sorry. Other questions? Yes. Your family dinners must be fantastic, yes. by the way. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for a great talk. You really got me thinking uh, with the opening around uh, essential workers. Yeah. Term essential workers. Yeah. And I'm just thinking that, well, cities have always been based on these power imbalances in which, you know, 
the elite have control over a group of workers for their so you take like kings and natives and go back to like why do cities exist? Right? And they, they needed control over enough agricultural production in order to compete. Right? So yeah. I'm just thinking that this is very similar, right? Uh, and you have to have it's like inequality is built into the very existence of yeah. cities. So let's let's use this language of the open secret. I mean it's it's not as if at some level we didn't know this before, but it is, a th it is a thing to declare as a matter of official policy that there are some workers who are essential and there are others who thereby, you know, therefore are not. And it seems to me like once you make that declaration, like once we say essential, not essential, there are some responsibilities that come with that, right? Insofar as like in, in politics is a place in which we express our values, right? We we now have some obligations that come with that declaration. Like we we've, we've all said this is the way it is. So then what? Right. So like one of the things I really didn't like in the pandemic, and I, there's a chapter in the book about you know about that deals with this question. You probably remember there were some people who were like they. You, it was like a hashtag and follow the science or like believe the science. I trust the science. But the problem with that whole idea that like there are some people who are for science and other people who are against science is that when you really get down to it, like the, the trickiness about managing situations like this is it's not about whether you follow the science or not. It's often about like which concerns trump the other ones. Like what do you, so for instance, like in the field of public health, it's, it's like a hybrid field. There's a lot of things that go into public health. So let's take one of the really thorny issues of the pandemic. Should we close the schools, and if so, for how long? Right. So the field of public health comes into this conversation. And now we have two sets of concerns. We could say, like, well, should we close the schools? If we close the schools, we think that we can reduce community transmission of this virus will prevent children from bringing home the virus to their parents or their grandparents. We'll also protect teachers and custodians and the groundskeepers and the kitchen workers, right? Like schools are made up of all of these grown-ups who might be significantly more vulnerable. And so we might say like, okay, first public health question, should we, should we close down schools? It was like manifestly, yes, we should, of course we should close down the schools we can reduce the spread of the disease, right? That's what the virologists tell us. But now, a whole other group of scientists come in the room and they say, you know, if we close the schools, the problem is, you know, first of all, we've got all these families and the, everybody's at home together and the parents in many cases have to work and there's gonna be all this like stress and anxiety and it's going to be it's the home is going to feel like a battleground it's going to be impossible and we might get these bad health outcomes we might even see like a spike in domestic violence if everybody's home all the time right we need to be worried about that and the kids might you know not get their meals so they would have a health problem worse they might say um if if the um if, if we close the schools what's going to happen is all the kids whose parents are pen professors are going to be fine because Yes, they'll learn, a little, they'll learn a little less than they would in a regular school year, but like the families are going to supplement their education and they're going to have conversations about policy at night and they're going to make sure the kids are reading books. and right. But the kids from families that are not Penn professors, they're not going to get all of that stimulation. They're not necessarily going to get that education. They might not even have laptops and tablets and phones where the kids can check in, so they might just drop out altogether. So in addition, we're going to have not just learning loss, but there's going to be a new, like a widening learning gap between the privileged kids and the less privileged kids, and that's going to generate inequality, right? Which is going to have all sorts of other health, right? So now, like you're in the public health world, you're, you, you, they're not all commensurable, and at some point you're going to find out, you're going to find yourself like making, you know, in this case, what I want to optimize for is A, or in this case, what I want to optimize for is B. And that becomes a question of values. 
It could be just the values of the one guy who's in power. It could be the values of the democracy. It depends on how that thing is set up. But in this policy domain, we're expressing values in this way. And I think what's so important to me is that on issue after issue in the United States, when it came time for us to express our values with policy, we wound up confused and chaotic and dysfunctional. And there were a couple areas where we had some successes, like the stimulus bill. Like We actually did prevent a lot of Americans from falling into deep poverty, and a lot of businesses were able to, to flourish. And we didn't do it in 2020, but in 2021, we did this incredible thing, the Child Poverty Reduction Act. We, we pulled more kids out of poverty than we ever have in any policy in American history. Five, six million kids. And then the next year, we got rid of both of those things. Right? We just said, no. It's like, again, it's like we got to this moral precipice. And you could see these, like, the values coming in. It's not that we didn't know that that stuff was there, but like, we, we named it. We saw it. We had a moment of opportunity. In some cases, we did it. And then we pulled it back. And like, one of the things that keeps me up at night, and I talked about this in Michael's class earlier today, one of the things that really keeps me up at night is like, if you talk to people in their 20s about their views of politics and the country right now, like it's, it's pretty worrisome because, and there's a chapter in the book you know, that's empirical on this. Like we did interviews with people in their 20s, different backgrounds. Um, they're very skeptical of key institutions, key social institutions. They're skeptical of government. They're skeptical of other people. And if you talk to young people about, like, are you going to vote in 2020, 24? Michael's class today with these super brilliant, engaging, amazing students, I didn't ask them if they were personally going to vote, but, like, are there people in your social circles you know who are, like, planning on just not voting? Well, basically, half the room raised their hand. And that's what the surveys are showing. Like, people are... People are not necessarily planning on voting. That's early days. And it's not just about like being disappointed from COVID. Obviously, there's lots of other issues that young people are upset about. That, you know, student debt, Israel, climate change, like you name your thing. There's lots of issues that come up that people are upset about. But we have a crisis, a kind of emerging crisis around disengagement. And I am pretty worried about this. All of us know people who grew up in the Depression, and we talk about this like Depression-era mentality, right? Like, uh, you're not going to spend the money on the large fries because you never know what's going to happen in the economy next, right? We all have like Depression-era mentality. It's like a thing that we can all connect to. So I don't know if there's going to be like a COVID generation, a 2020 generation, like, the people who have in, like developed these enduring sensibilities. But something happened, very powerful and very formative. And I think we should be listening. Like, in 20, people in their 20s, they sacrificed a tremendous amount so that their parents and their grandparents, the rest of us, could be OK, right? They, they went remote. They gave up the parties. They didn't go to bars. They didn't socialize. They ended relationships. They lost their jobs. They didn't go to graduate school. All these things happened. And not only you know, have we not really, really shown up in response, but like, we didn't really say thanks. And I think people are pissed off about it. How are we doing? It's okay. Robin, yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Eric. This is an amazing talk. And um, I just started uh, reading your book. It's an amazing book. Um, um, so my question is, you know, maybe you cover this uh, later in your book, the fact that you have some chapters that are more you know, analytical and then kind of start to read the story. Um, so all the stories about delusion. Very powerful. Yeah. And uh, my question is really, I want to hear your thoughts about uh, whether in the book you cover this or you thought about the possibilities of uh, building connection, yeah. building solidarity, yeah. overcoming this kind of yeah. solution. Yeah, so there's a great chapter in the book for you. It's waiting for you to read it. <laughs> what? It's called The Bridge. <laughs> and it's a story about a woman named Nulo Doherty. And and, and, it, and it's really a story, it's a story about the, the best case of solidarity and working together outside of the movement for black lives, but a much more ubiquitous and mundane one, the um, 
it's, it's a chapter that's about the rise of mutual aid societies, mutual aid networks. It's an amazing thing that happened all over the country, all over the world in 2020. When governments broke down and were unable to deliver what people needed, these mutual aid networks sprouted up. And Nula Doherty, who's the key figure in the chapter on, called The Bridge, you know, she's like a retired district attorney. She's Irish immigrant family, married to an Ecuadorian guy. They live in Jackson Heights, which is one of the most dense and crowded and diverse neighborhoods on earth. Something like 170 languages spoken in Jackson Heights. Um, she's been involved in the neighborhood for a long time. She's raised kids there. She's a doer. And she retires as a district attorney, and she decides she's going to run for local office. And she's running a really bad campaign. It's not going all that well. The pandemic starts, early cases of COVID, and she realizes, like, this neighborhood is in for it, not just because of the density and the crowding, but so many people in Jackson Heights are you know, low-wage immigrant laborers who are connected to the economy that was about to close down, you know, like restaurants and all kinds of service work. They were in big trouble, and they weren't just going to get stimulus funds. So she puts on this post-it note. She writes her phone number and says, like, you know, if, if you need help, call me. And then she goes to a copy machine, makes a copy, and she makes these little posters and starts to circulate them in the neighborhood. So it says, like, the, within a day or two, there are hundreds of people calling her. And then there are thousands of people calling so then she does other amazing thing. She, um, she then puts out another post-it note, and it says, if you can help, call me. And pretty soon, hundreds of people are calling her to help. And now she's got this network of people bringing in food and diapers and cleaning supplies, and she clears out her basement, and she starts this thing that she calls the COVID care neighborhood network and more people sign up and more people volunteer to help her run it and they get this like someone showed me the notebook they have with all the phone numbers and the volunteer times and they generate this operation that's like in time fe feeding thousands of people and cleaning you know, all these amazing things and then the, it's like a fairly nimble little organization that now shifts and there's like now we're going to help you get vaccines, and now we're going to help you make sure that you don't get evicted from, you know, by your landlord who's going to tell you that they're evicting you even though it's illegal to do that because there's a moratorium on evictions. And now you know, Jackson Heights doesn't have a big green park, and so now we're going to try to work together to open up an avenue as an open street and turn like this big avenue into a park. And it's like an amazing story of civic integration and solidarity and... I got a call from an editor at New York Magazine a few weeks ago, and he's like, we'd really like you to, we'd really like to include the chapter about NULA as a profile, you know, in the magazine, but it would be great if you could find out what she's doing now and update it. So I called NULA. <coughs> Want to know what she's doing now? Curious? So the basement where Nula started the COVID Care Neighborhood Network is now the Jackson Heights Immigration Center. And Nula and the people from the Mutual Aid Network, along with a bunch of recently arrived migrants in New York City, and we have about 150,000 of them, um, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they have a legal clinic, a free legal clinic, in her ba the same basement that had the toilet paper and the diapers, the same basement, and I went for one of them. It was like 60 people every Monday, Wednesday, Friday go in. And they do the paperwork. She's, she's a lawyer. And she's got this staff, this like all-volunteer staff. And then on, and, they, and they start at 10 in the morning. They, they meet on an open street a few blocks away because she couldn't give out her address because she started like waking up at 3 in the morning and there were crowds of people sleeping outside of her house. So she... They, they, they walk people over to her house, and then from 10 in the morning until about 1 in the morning, they just work to help people fill out their paperwork, because once you fill out your asylum paperwork and you submit it to the INS, what happens is if they haven't responded in six months, by law they have to give you a Social Security card. 
and they can't do anything in six months because they have all these applications. So this is the way you can get people to work. So why do I tell you the story? Because in the same way that I think it's not time yet to say 2020 did X or Y, I also thought that's like there's an invisible thing that's in motion. Well, there is now, I think, in Philadelphia and New York and Chicago and Oakland and Los Angeles and Pittsburgh and all these cities, there's, there's an invisible civic infrastructure that we're not necessarily seeing made up of people who got activated to deal with these crises in 2020. And they're now probably on a smaller scale than in 2020 because it doesn't feel like the emergency is quite as acute and widespread, but they're doing all these things to take care of each other and to generate a different ethic of care and responsibility that's the kind of ethic that we need to not lose out to the dark side. And I think that's a good you know, place for us to, to land. I think we really are like at this pivotal moment and as important it is for us to tell the story of the things we did wrong and the things we have to learn from 2020, it's also important for us to recognize we did some extraordinary things for each other and with each other as well. And there is this other legacy that we need to draw on and channel for the challenges that are coming next. So, all right, thank you all very much.